Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Pot and Grow Magazine's Pot and Companion podcast. The summer heat's setting in, crop appears to be pulling itself back on schedule, and there are weeds to manage, bugs to scout, and, and PGRs to keep things under control. In other words, it's fairly normal for mid-July in most parts of the cotton belt. I'm Jim Stedman, Senior Editor of Cotton Grower, and as always, I'm joined by Cotton Grower Editor Frank Giles. Frank, your neck of the woods just dodged another hurricane or tropical storm, depending on, I guess, on the hour at that point, as, uh, as Elsa came through Florida and up the coast. How many Let It Go references did you have to put up with, especially considering how close the storm came to Disney World? Well, I have to confess that I probably was responsible before, for more than I actually received. <laughs> <laughs> I used that joke uh, quite liberally during the uh, last few days, but here in Orlando it was not much of, a, uh, of an event. We probably had maybe three inches of rain here, but from the big bend over toward Jacksonville, there were some areas that got a, quite a bit of rain and some, some impacts from wind, but uh, mostly a big rain event for those folks. Yeah, well, let's hope some of that as it headed up the coast was uh, was beneficial rain for some of those growers that needed a little bit of moisture. Absolutely. Okay. Well, as we mentioned, the, uh, the crop's kind of setting in for its summer stretch following sort of a long, drawn-out planting season. So we thought it'd be a good time to find out more about some of the latest cotton research projects that are underway in fields and at universities near you. Dr. Cater Hake with Cotton Incorporated will join us here in the virtual Cotton Companion studio in just a few minutes to help explain some of that work and some of the benefits it may bring to your farm. We hope you'll stay tuned for that discussion in this, the 99th episode of the Cotton Companion. But first, Frank, what kind of news do we have across the cotton belt? Jim, we've got a, quite a bit to talk about regarding cotton acres this year. First, looking at cotton numbers in USDA's early July crop progress report. Overall, cotton maturity is beginning to catch up Cotton squaring is now reported in 42% of the crop and 10% from up 10% from a week ago and just behind the five-year average for early July. With the largest weekly gains reported in Alabama, Arkansas, and Mississippi. Reports of bowl set continue to increase, to increase now up 11% nationally, just shy of the 5% or five-year average for early July. The report also showed very little change in crop condition numbers with 52% of the U.S. crop still rated good to excellent, 38% fair, and 10% rated poor to very poor. That information came on the heels of the USDA's Planted Acres report issued on June 30th. That showed an estimated 11.7 million acres of upland and Pima cotton for 2021 down 3% from the final total for 2020. Upland area is estimated at 11.6 million acres, down 3% from 2020. And Pima area is estimated at 142,000 acres, down 30% from 2020. On a regional basis, total cotton acres in the Southeast for 2021 were reported at 2,350,000 acres, down about 18,000 acres from 2020. In the Mid-South, the total for 2021 reported acres, it was 1,720,000 acres, down roughly 80,000 acres from last year. Southwest reported acres totaled 7,310,000, a 210,000 acre decrease from last year. In the West, 317,000 total acres reported, down 49,000 acres from 2020. Pima acres in the western states dropped to 120,000 acres in 2021, a loss of 44,000 acres. And Pima acres in Texas dropped 22,000 acres, down 16,000 acres from last year. To no one's surprise, the report also noted cotton producers planted 97% of their acres this year with biotech varieties up 1% from 2020. Uh, Jim, just, I think that, yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to jump in here and say, you know, since this report was, you know, was, was issued, it's, there's been a lot of question out there in terms of, are these numbers actually a little bit too high for some of these regions? 
and again, well, I think we have to keep in mind that these these numbers were based on, I think it was June one, early June, uh, when these numbers were 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 out there, uh, or were were tabulated. Uh, since then, we've had some obviously big rain event in uh, Mississippi and Arkansas. Uh, we've had uh, you know obviously some some flooding areas in certain parts of Texas. Uh, we've still got drought in other areas. Um, I think I think a lot of people are, are figuring this number is going to change quite a bit by the time the next report from USDA, which kind of certifies acres, comes out in September. But you know, I guess we would be remiss if we didn't go back to January when uh, when we did our first acreage survey. We were the first ones out of the gate, and I think our number was eleven point six eight million so we, acres for this year. We're, we're pretty, pretty close to that that number right now. So yeah, you know, I think, you know. I, you know and, and, you know, I felt good about the number at the time, and, and I guess a lot of other people did too, but I'm, I'm really just kind of shocked that, that, you know, USDA sort of landed right around that number as well. It's, uh, yeah. I think as we were talking about it the other day, it's sort of, you know, sometimes there's, uh, there's not a whole lot of, of, of magic or skill involved in this. Sometimes it's just the blind squirrel theory that occasionally you do find, find the right acorn out there. That's so. right. So and then we'll take, mother, it, we'll take it this year and, and, and hope nobody has expectations for us for next year. And then let mother nature decide the rest. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we've got big news over at the uh, U S cotton protocol. Um, they've added some new significant members to the program. First Gildan activewear and its portfolio of brands, including Gildan all style, American Apparel and Comfort Colors joined the trust protocol in late June. Gildan is one of the world's largest manufacturers of everyday basic apparel and one of the largest domestic consumers of U.S. cotton, which represents most of the fiber used in the company's products. Next came Tesco, the leading retailer in the United Kingdom, which signed on as part of its commitment to sourcing 100% sustainable cotton by 2025. The company has an, an ambitious sustainability program, which includes promoting sustainable agricultural practices that protect soil health and biodiversity and providing transparency throughout its supply chain for its home and clothing product lines. That was quickly followed in early July by word that Levi Strauss and Company and its legendary brands, Levi's, Dockers, Denizen, by Levi's and signature by Levi's and Strauss has joined the trust protocol. More than 90% of Levi's, Strauss and company products are cotton based and the company has committed to sourcing 100% more sustainably grown cotton focusing on decreasing water use, cutting carbon emissions and reducing fertilizer and pesticide use. To date, the US cotton trust protocol has welcomed more than 450 brand retail, mill, and manufacturing members since its launch in 2020. All right. Well, thanks, Frank. And uh, uh, always good news when, uh, when we see more, more folks jumping into and more companies jumping into to join the protocol. Yep. More reason for growers to check it out and uh, get signed up as well. Absolutely. Well, now let's shift our focus to cotton research in its many shapes and forms. And while growers are busy managing this year's crop, the work being done to improve multiple aspects of cotton production is certainly underway across all the cotton belt. And much of it's done by corporations and universities, certainly, and much of that's also due to the involvement of Cotton Incorporated. So joining us today in our virtual studio to discuss some of those projects and some of the benefits that may soon bring, they may soon bring to the farm level is Dr. Cater Hake, Vice President of Agricultural and Environmental Research for Cotton Incorporated. Cater, it's been a few seasons since uh, we've had a chance to visit. Uh, welcome back to the Cotton Companion. Thank you. Always enjoy these opportunities. I'm looking forward to it. Sounds great. Well, first of all, it, uh, it seems like business as usual for your research team right now, uh, that the country has kind of opened back up a little bit. How did 2020 impact the things you were able to do, uh, especially since the business of cotton never really stopped? You know, you're absolutely right. It did impact us. We are more efficient. You know, we used to get on a plane and go on a meet with a cooperator. And Galen Morgan, who's with us, he pioneered the face 
they FaceTime field visit. So he didn't have a cooperator take his, his uh, iPhone out into the field and hit FaceTime and walk around the plot and, and uh, inspect, make sure everything's going well and save two days and about $1,000 worth of travel. Um, we did, you know, just like most people, an awful lot of Zoom and we've got Zoom fatigue, but um, we, we are going to come out of here more efficient. We're getting out, meeting with people. Nothing can um, replace that. But we're finding that, that a lot of things, you know, staying on top of research, we can do remotely. Sounds good. Now, you have been out and about this uh, so far this season. Uh, from your perspective, how's the crop looking right now? Well, it, we're just having, you know, what a terrible time to have, uh, you know, it's a high blood, pressure, high blood pressure period for growers because, you know, prices are, are healthy uh, for all the commodities, but yet it's, you know, for instance, West Texas, they were down to their planting deadlines before they got a planting rain. That's mm -hmm. in West Texas. In South Texas, they were, they, they did get some of that acreage planted, but it was drying up. And it, it wasn't until right at the mid, last minute that it started pouring. And then it hasn't stopped raining. And, you know, so it's been a heart attack, as they call, you talk about a heart attack season. Um, you know, the Mid-South, corn solves a lot of growers' problems because it's a healthy <laughs> seedling. And so the acreage that went, it's cold tolerance. And so I understand a lot of the Mid-South went into, into corn. But those areas that are really dominant in cotton, which is the Southwest and the Southeast, man, it's, it's been a tough start getting it going. Decatur, I understand that uh, Cotton Incorporated is involved in a number of projects across the Cotton Belt, some involving several universities. What's uh, Cotton Incorporated's role in these types of projects? You know, that's a wonderful question because my mission is to improve the profitability of U.S. cotton production. And so that's a pretty broad, um, and our tool to do that is all the growers chip in money to do things collectively that they couldn't do individually, right? You know, there the, the very few growers, maybe at Boswell in California, that can afford to have a research team refining fertilizer rates, irrigation, bug control. And so we try to focus in on those things that are big, Money makers are money losers for growers, and um, and you and fund public sector research because we want this to be available to everyone. You know, everyone in the U.S. gets access. Doesn't matter whether the research is done in it Clemson, South Carolina, or it's done by Texas Tech in Lubbock. People put it into you know, what we call the public domain, and so everyone can share in it and build upon it. Uh, so that's a, that's our main job and mission. Now, can you give us a few examples of some of the projects that uh, that you're really excited about right now? Well, one I'm super excited about it is because unfortunately um, it's been a real problem and that's planting seed quality. You know, 15 years ago, I left a, a seed company that was bought out by a bigger company. And so anyone can imagine who that might've been. But so I, I'm a seedsman in a former life and I'm embarrassed with the product that has been put out. And it's only been since 2019 that this has been elevated. And it was elevated because of the terrible harvest of 2018. When so the seed that got sold in 19 and there's growers in the Southeast that were blaming themselves. They, you know, they're professional planters. They've done that for 30 years and they, they couldn't get a stand and blaming themselves. And then only after the fact realized that that the problem was was uh, quality of the seed. So we have a belt wide effort. It's run by Galen Morgan and it's done really with two objectives. One is to uh, identify uh, and elevate the issue of quality seed. And Galen's a little more diplomatic than I am. I call it a shine and shame <laughs> type program. Shine a big spotlight. And, um, and let's call out problems when we have a problem. Uh, but the second objective that Galen has is try to give the seed companies and growers and state seed labs tools to better measure quality seed. Because we know, and, and Galen's just redone the work with uh, this Beltwide, 
And it's led out of Texas by Murillo Maida, but it's a beltwide effort. Um, and he's shown just what we've known is that if you can get a stand within seven days, you've got a much better chance of getting a good yield than if it takes 10 days or longer to get that stand. And, um, and, and so we're, you know, we're looking at a whole bunch of aspects of quality. One that's, that people know about, but people have not looked at is damage, mechanical damage called BMD. Mm -hmm. And companies have very high tolerances. And we're, we're digging into that in real detail, taking close photographs of seeds before they're germinated. Um, and seeds now have all sorts of camouflage colorant on them, you know, so it makes it difficult to see. But if you take a lot of photographs of individual seeds and then germinate it, we're finding that even a small amount of visual damage can create a, a total absence of a taproot. And it, as we know, most of the U.S., if you don't have a taproot, that you're never going to see that seedling. You're just going to think you didn't have a, you know, it was a poor stand for something. In the southeast, because, it, you know, if the rains come, where we're actually you can get a stand, but the first big wind that comes along or first big drought, that's the plant that blows over or dies. Um, so that, that seed quality and planting seed quality, I think we can do a lot of good. I can't think we can, you know, we're talking with all of the seed companies, sharing all of the data with them, their individual company data, and they have been super responsive. I've been real pleased. Um, I've joined all those calls. And so I think the seed companies, they want to do better. So they're looking forward to tools that will help them. And they want to see that whole standard be elevated and raised in, in a more um, precise, precise way. What projects do you think are going to bring some real value to growers uh, in their operations? And uh, any, any indications that you can share on, on maybe when some of this, this work might be available? Well, the, one of the biggest areas that I'm, I'm really excited about is just the old fashioned fertilization. You know, we've been fertilizing crops forever, but now we've got the situation where most of the U.S. cotton is rotated and it's rotated with crops like corn uh, that leave a lot of nutrients out there. And so we have been redoing the older work and we've just got the, uh, the potassium beltwide effort done. So 23 site years across the belt, looking at potassium and trying to predict whether we need a potassium fertilizer based on the soil test. And we just can't do it, be honest with you. We're not seeing economic responses to potassium, except for in very rare cases that seem to be associated with, um, with moisture. You know, if you get a, a, a drought and the surface dries and all your potassium is in the surface, then, um, you know, then, then, you know, we've got a problem with the water down below with potassium up above. And so we did get a response there, but the vast majority of research sites, we are not seeing a response to potassium. And I think that's really important. If growers are on the fence about applying potassium with the prices this year, of that nutrient certainly leave a massive strip, you know, in, in a field and, or leave half a field untreated. Um, you know, this is the year to test uh, the bottom of fertilizer rates, um, you know, because of the price of the fertilizer and getting off to a late start. Uh, anything in terms of, uh, of insect control? At this yes, point? The, the insect is, um, you know, we're really fortunate we've got good tools right now, but we keep having to look over our shoulder because there's a massive hippopotamus <laughs> coming at us uh, called insect resistance. And so we're seeing, um, you know, oversprays on, on the three gene BT technologies creeping up. Um, and and I, I, in a former life, I worked with that technology. And, and so I know it's it's not as robust as the, you know, the previous combination. Um, and so we're, we are close to having probably not the same challenges we have with, with pigweed, but, but we're close to really having uh, some big challenges with insect control. So the, probably the most important thing 
that the entomologists are doing is constantly tweaking the IPM thresholds and guidelines how in their regional, you know, whether you spray on egg counts or spray on worms, that depends on the level of resistance out there. And so um, we're doing everything possible to help help growers uh, save cost and and ad adapt a, their management program for insects to current conditions as fast as possible. Okay, a couple of weeks ago, I was with Larry Steckel up at, uh, at Jackson, Tennessee for his weed tour. Great and tour. I hear it was uh, well attended and Gaylor Morgan was, was there. There were a lot of happy people, you know, you know, it was a nice day, happy to be outside, I think, and, and, yeah. and, with, and with a lot of folks. But Larry mentioned that, you know, of course he's got lots of herbicide studies looking at rates and things like that. But he also mentioned that they're trying to pull some of the older chemistry back out and running some more tests on that to see what might be possible in, in this battle with, with pigweed and, and goosegrass and, and anything else. Are you guys involved in some of those studies? Yes, as well? we are. We're supporting that work. And I know we're supporting Larry, but also some of that work's being done in Mississippi. And you're absolutely right. You know, when Roundup came along, we put a lot of stuff on the shelf uh, just because Roundup was so good. And they, so the grower tolerance for injury dropped to virtually nothing. And now if you ask growers how much crop injury they're going to tolerate, they're going to say a lot, you know, yeah. they, instead of hoeing weeds, right? Or that pigweed escape with a thousand, a million seeds. Um, it, so there, there's an effort to look at herbicides that are approved in the U.S. on other crops, but have not gone forward in cotton. And those are the ones that, uh, you know, they're older products, they're probably uh, off patent generic, and, uh, and there may be an opportunity to find some material. One thing I'll comment on that, that um, we're seeing that you can apply some of these early and have zero impact on yield. So, you know, we, we did that in the past before Roundup, right? We took a lot of beating up with MSMA, right? On crop right. turned to red and and um, and came back it was fine. So the, this research is being done, both looking at the impact on weeds, but looking at if there's a window when we can apply it to cotton and not impact yield. Um, you know, there's not going to be a silver bullet in that pile. But at this point, we're desperate for anything other than hoeing. Yeah, it's sort of a re-education process with with some of these products. Absolutely. And Larry's been phenomenal, his leadership in, in that community and his willingness to share and innovation. I mean, looking at how you get herbicides in on various, you know, when resin, cover crops, you know, how you get them down into, you know, get to be activated in the soil. You know, he's just very forward thinking, but he's in ground zero for weed problems, right? Yeah. At, uh, yeah no question about that. Well, you know, and, 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 course looking ahead to this season you know we're we're heading toward harvest you know probably sooner than than we realized that's right it'll be here you know upon us what what kind of work are you guys doing in terms of ginning right now well yeah we're doing a lot of work and you know the central focus is on contamination and you know because that's the um you know that's it, it really a demand destroyer if we get a reputation of being contaminated uh, I was at a meeting in um, in Arizona with the Jenners now about a month ago, and the manager of the classing office, the local classing office, made the statement that if if you can find plastic in a, a bale sample, which is a half a pound, likely the whole bale, or there's another thousand bales out there that have plastic, right? You're only looking at a half a pound in 500. So the problem is much, much, much bigger than actually the, the bales that get a call. Um, and they find these now in the textile mills because they install these high-tech cleaners in the textiles to remove this stuff and put it in a little baggie. And then when someone from Cotton Incorporated or the U.S. shows up, they slap it down on the table and, and, and blame us. Uh, Vicki Martin is the one that takes the brunt of that, she and her team. Um, but so we've installed one of those machines. It's called a Trusler. And what it allows us to do is to run really precise experiments looking at, at different um, module wrap materials, different way of moving modules around, 
um, removal systems like the Viper and the Gin and, and really quantify in those bales what's in that bale besides opening it up on the floor and looking at it, you right. know, run it through one of these machines. Uh, another area that we're heavily invested in uh, and it's new for us is machine learning or artificial intelligence for gins. Uh, Dr. Ed Barnes in our department has got a group of about 20 ginners and it's led by David Blakemore, who's a real innovative ginner in Missouri. And, um, but it, there's about 20 gins across the US and these ginners uh, meet with Ed and the science team and they're looking at ways to get better value cost savings from the data they already have. And so we're working with, um, with SAS, which is a big statistical company right here in our neighborhood to try to give, uh, to see what efficiencies we can extract from the gins uh, using data they have. And I'm really excited about that. The preliminary data is looking, looking interesting. Uh, you know, nothing that's a, a big money saver right now, but that's an innovative way is to use artificial intelligence to improve gin efficiency. Sounds good. Well, Cater, this seems like a pretty good place to uh, sort of call time on today's discussion. Uh, thanks so much for taking time to join us, uh, particularly on short notice. I really oh, appreciate I, that. Anytime. I, I love visiting with you all. And, and good, to, good to see you guys both on Zoom. We we'll look forward to seeing, seeing you live sometime. Sounds good. Well, we're going to be looking for some positive news out of all this. and and. Would love to bring you back maybe for a recap later this year. Anytime, anytime. Sounds great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Cater. And once again, that's it for this episode of the Cotton Companion Podcast. As always, thank you, dear listeners, for joining us. If you like what you hear on the Cotton Companion, please be sure to spread the word and tell your farmer friends about this podcast. And here's how they can find us. You can find the Cotton Companion in three easy ways. First, go to cottongrower.com forward slash companion or simply click the podcast tab at the top of the homepage. Second, subscribe to our channel on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts these days. And three, sign up for our weekly e-newsletter, the Cotton Grower e-news, that's delivered to your email inbox every Tuesday morning. You can do that by going to cottongrower.com forward slash subscribe. Also, be sure to follow Cotton Grower on social media. We are at Cotton Grower Mag on Twitter. And on Facebook, you'll find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine. Well, if the June-July issue of Cotton Grower isn't in your mailbox yet, it will be soon. Uh, so be sure to watch for it. The Cotton Companion podcast comes to you twice monthly and is produced by Tyler Hatch and Kim Henderson, our talented colleagues at the World Headquarters for Meister Media Worldwide in lovely Willoughby, Ohio. My name's Jim Stedman, his name's Frank Giles, and we'll be back with you in two weeks with the 100th episode of The Cotton Companion. So until then, stay safe. Yeah, he works and he works and he works and he works all day. God made it for me.